Hello there, welcome to iPad Pros, the podcast all about professionals using the iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. Welcome to this week's episode of iPad Pros. On today's episode, I just want to talk a little bit about this article that came out on MacStories.net, What I Wish the iPad Would Gain from the Mac, by Ryan Christoffel. So in today's episode, I'm going to dive into all the things he covers in this and kind of give my feedback about the the thoughts here and if you haven't read this article i'd highly encourage you to do so it's over at macstories.net and just search what i wish the ipad would gain from the mac and it's a really great article and i'd highly recommend it so without further ado let's just dive into the meat of what's covered and what could happen to the iPad in the future. And a lot of the things in this article that Ryan wrote in my mind are just no brainers for Apple to do at some point in the future. Now, whether that future is iOS 12, 13, 14, whenever it is, I think a lot of these things can and should happen. And I'm going to include some extras that he didn't include in his article. So the first thing Ryan talks about in this article is multiple instances of an app. This is something from the Mac that is very commonplace. You have windowing and the ability to have, say, two windows of a pages instance open at once. So you have two different pages documents open simultaneously. And this is something, of course, that I would love to have on, on an iPad. I get around this issue by working off of two iPads during my workday. I've got my small pro, my big pro, and when I need two instances of the instances of the same app, that currently requires two different iPads, and that really shouldn't be the case. You see Safari uh, have this ability of having split screen of the same app, and Ryan makes the very astute observation here that the whole tab interface brings up a good gesture interface to actually enable this ability. Think of this gesture or think of this interaction mode of uh, you have a single app and you just hit command T or you have some way of making a new tab of that current app. So now you have tabs. That's great. But how do you get into windowing mode? So the thought here is you drag a tab to the other side of the screen and then you have a window. Or you could grab that tab and drag it potentially to another app. And then you have two instances of that same app running simultaneously. So this is really one of the best examples I've heard of how you would actually implement this. Because every time I've heard of trying to do this, having two instances of the same app running, I thought from a UI standpoint, this would be a hard thing to solve. But this tabbed interface and dragging a tab makes a ton of sense. And as Ryan points out in his article, this has been added to the Mac in a big way of any Mac app can really support tabs now. And this is something that if it came to iOS, this would be huge. Uh, The ability to have two text documents from the same app open at once would be great. Uh, Having two things from Ulysses open at once. Having a reference sheet and your active worksheet open at once. This would be fantastic and really useful. If you're doing work in uh, different PDFs, you have uh, a PDF you're referencing while working on another one. There's endless use cases where you'd want two instances of the same app open at once and great execution here. So this, I think, should definitely come over from the Mac. Now, let me dive into something that is not mentioned in Ryan's article, and that is just external file support. There's no reason iOS, especially the iPad, should not support the ability to have external hard drives just plugged into it and actually reading and writing directly to it from any third-party app as you would on the Mac. This is a no-brainer, and there is a Files app now, and it should support native SD card SD cards so you don't have to do crazy hacks to get files onto your device. Working with big video projects, uh, potentially having Final Cut on the iPad, you really should have external file support from hard drives. So that is something that I think should come over from the Mac, that it would be an amazing thing to have. 
Uh, the next thing in Ryan's article here is more diverse hardware. So more diverse hardware. This is pretty self-evident. If you look at the Mac, it's got a huge lineup from the Mac Mini all the way up to the Mac Pro, the iMac Pro, and the laptop line from the MacBook to the MacBook Pro. It's got a very diverse lineup of hardware. As Ryan points out in this article, there are 23 potential options for Mac buyers. On the iPad side, you've got the iPad and the iPad Pro and the iPad Mini 4. And within that, you've got some different breakdowns of storage and screen sizes. But really, there's not a bunch of variety. And then form factor as well. The Mac has form factor varieties of headless Macs, such as the Mac Pro and the Mac Mini. It's got laptop clamshell varieties, such as the MacBook and MacBook Pro. And it's got all-in-ones like the iMac and the iMac Pro. So what Ryan's pointing out is, why not experiment with different form factors? In iOS currently, we've got slabs of glass. We've got small slabs of glass from the Apple Watch all the way up to the 13-inch, the 12.9-inch iPad Pro. Why not expand from slabs of glass to, say, a clamshell iOS device? Uh, one of the huge benefits of a clamshell iOS device would be battery life. Windows is starting to release some of these laptop devices that are running on ARM chips, and they're quoting things like 20 hours of battery life with a cel cellular chip running. So imagine what you could do battery life-wise with a clamshell iPad. You wouldn't call it iPad at that point, but the clamshell iOS device, you're able to do a lot more with battery in that way. And just, it's a comfortable form factor that a lot of people like. And it's something that I'm not sure if I would jump aboard right away. I do like being able to just rip the screen off my keyboard and put it in the dock and having the two iPads side by side like that. But it is something that I would consider. Would I potentially replace my bigger iPad Pro with maybe a, a really big clamshell? That's a potential thing. Maybe a 15-inch clamshell iOS device. That would be really interesting. Something also that's I didn't see mentioned in Ryan's article, but uh, the Apple TV is an iOS device. It is the only other form factor that I can think of. It is a headless iOS device, so to speak, kind of like the Mac Mini. It's got a radically different UI because of this. It's for the TV. But something the Apple TV has is a trackpad. This whole gesture UI based on that trackpad of highlighting what you're doing based on just visual feedback. There's no mouse, but there is trackpad support. Taking that from the Apple TV, bringing it into some kind of iOS clamshell device would be potentially really interesting. It would alleviate the need to touch the screen in cases where you're just doing simple interactions of scrolling from one thing to another or uh, you know selecting text, stuff like that. So there's a lot of potential for Apple to do a way to implement a trackpad in a smart way that makes sense of iOS that isn't strictly a mouse. And maybe some apps would enable a mouse input, but I think it wouldn't need to be a system-wide thing, but could be an application-by-application -application basis based on the purpose of what you're doing there. Because I don't think a mouse is necessary all the time, but sometimes it is really nice. And say you have a VNC application where actually remoting into a Mac. What if, you know, you could actually support a Mac, uh, a mouse for that instance? That would be really interesting. The other form factor mentioned in this article on Mac Stories is the Microsoft desktop surface. This huge, say, I believe 27-inch touchscreen that just comes down from a vertical mode and kind of swivels down in front of you as this nice work area to, to work in. And this is an idea that I'm actually pretty excited about. I can imagine a day where you actually do have a desktop iPad. And, and why not? You could have really creative interfaces to go along with that. They'd have to redesign a lot of what iOS is, but 
I can imagine a day where, yeah, you do have this huge surface you're working on and you can have multiple iOS apps that you're dragging around and reordering on this, this huge screen and you could do some really interesting things with that form factor. And from a power perspective, that thing could scream. You could put a lot of powerful chips in there. You wouldn't have to worry about battery life because it's going to be always plugged in. And there would be a lot of just awesome things you could do with that form factor. So that's something I think should happen someday for having this huge desktop iPad. Figuring out the form factor and making that work well would be essential, I think. Figuring out a keyboard solution for that, uh, if it would probably be a hardware keyboard. And then, you know, how do you interact with that? I think you need to find a way to not have your arm moving in a way where it's going to get tired from trying to go over 27 inches at a time. You might need to find creative solutions for that interface that would combine the great touch interface you have now with some other other interaction methods. So next up in the article here uh, is persistent background privileges for apps. Now this is something I run across every day. It's something that you're able to do on the Mac quite nicely. If you're rendering a video in Final Cut Pro, you're exporting it, you can have that app in the background. You don't need to have that app for screen to be continuing the process. On iOS, on the iPad, this is not the case. If you're exporting a movie from iMovie or LumaFusion, if you hit that home button on accident, that export will just cancel out because of iOS's kind of ridiculous nature for not allowing background usage. And this is something that I understood its original intention. As Ryan points out, battery life is so key on the iPhone. But with the iPad Pro, and especially when it's getting power, when it's getting uh, a charge, and it's basically acting as a laptop, it should be able to run stuff in the background. It should be able to have apps like on the Mac, you have things like Hazel, that it's just constantly running, looking for a new file to be created, and then it'll do something with that file. Or a Clipboard Manager. There are many apps that cannot exist on iOS simply because of the limitations of the OS. And this is something that should be lifted at some point, and I hope Apple does look into, because we're very close for, I think, a lot of people to be able to make the switch to iOS as their main computer. I think we are within years of it becoming a mainstream thing, that as people get older, as kids are aging, they will want to use iOS as their main computer. And as people need to start replacing Macs, they'll be looking towards the I- iPad. Apple, I hope, gets it to a point where everyone's ready to do that. Now, the next one here, I mentioned Final Cut Pro earlier in this episode, and that is professional software from Apple. Apple should be creating logic. They should be creating Final Cut Pro Pro for iOS, for the iPad. iMovie is a joke. It is one of the most ba- most basic editors that you can't do much with. And it's kind of an embarrassment to me that LumaFusion has managed to just blow anything that Apple has created for the iPad out of the water. It's great that third parties are creating professional apps, But Apple should show third parties how it's done by creating some apps of their own. Final Cut Pro 10, Logic Pro 10, and Xcode are examples that he uses. They're great examples. In Xcode in particular, you should be able to write apps for iOS on a gigantic iPad Pro. There's no reason this should not be a thing. Apple should really lead the way and create professional apps for the iPad uh, to show users and to show developers that this is a platform that we endorse as a platform to get work done and to create content with. That is something that definitely should happen. And again, with Alka Pro, it should support external hard drives. It should do a lot of really advanced things that we haven't seen yet. 
The next one and the final one on his list here, Ryan's list, is multi-user support. Now this is a feature that is available to educational institutions, but for whatever reason, uh, it still has not made it to the consumer version of iOS. It's something that is a no-brainer. As a computer, as a main computer, not everyone will have their own. Families should be able to have one iPad that's their desktop iPad or whatever it is and have multi-users where everyone could log in. It would show them different home directory for files. So when they open up the files app, it would have different files there. You have your own iCloud account associated with that user. You'd have different apps showing up. This is a no-brainer and should be here. So... Yeah, these are all great things that Apple should take from the Mac and bring over to iOS, to the iPad. It's it's close. And, and as Ryan mentions at the end of this article, all these things are very doable for Apple to do. It's not a huge leap for them to add tabs to apps and let those become their own instances of apps. It's not a huge leap to have different hardware form factors and make pro apps for it and it's it's not a huge leap to do all these things and i really hope apple continues the march they started last year with ios 11 and continue on and to make the ipad the next computer for the main for everyone and it's getting there and i hope they do a lot of these things like that so if there are other things you would like to see from iOS, uh, from the Mac, I mean, over to the iOS, please let me know. You can send your feedback to iPadProsPodcast at gmail.com. One thing before I wrap up the show is ex- external display support would be something really cool if Apple could also take over from the Mac. Now, this would be a much harder thing to figure out. It would need to be a touch screen that's external. There'd have to be a way to do interaction methods that work with that. Because with a mouse, you can just use your mouse and go across different displays. With an external display on iOS, how would you implement that? Because you couldn't drag your finger from one display to another. So there would have to be a lot of creative solutions to make that work. But some kind of external display solution would be huge. Currently, the way to do this is just to have a separate computer, a separate iPad to have as your second display. And that's not a bad solution for for many people. But that is another thing from the Mac that would be really nice to to have carried over to the iPad. Uh, The other thing I should say I'd love to have on the iPad carrying over from the Mac is kind of like a scratch pad of workspace. You have your desktop on the Mac, and people give a lot of people crap for messy desktops and stuff, but it is really nice to just be able to have a scratch pad to work on. Just I'm going to have these files here, and they're all kind of here just temporarily as I'm working on things. I'd like to be able to drag a file to my home screen. You know, have the home screen of the iPad be able to store more things. Have it become a desktop for your iPad. And have some files that are there, maybe stored as aliases or some other way. But have your desktop be available on iOS. A place where you can be uh, working on a project and not have to go into the files app and, and dump something in there. So that is another thing from the Mac that would be a really, really nice feature. Also, as far as bringing things back from the, over from the Mac, FTP access within the files app natively would be great. On the Mac, you can just hit Command-K and connect to a server. Why isn't that built in the iOS? Bring over all the things that make sense. If you can connect to a server on the Mac just like that, make it available on iOS. To give the power to users that should be there, it's baffling why it's not there. So, there we go. That is this week's episode on what I wish the iPad would gain from the Mac. Great article by Ryan over at Mac Stories. I'd highly encourage you to give it a read. Well worth your time. So with that, thanks for listening to this episode. Please send topic requests over to iPadProsPodcast at gmail.com. If you have a chance, please review the show on iTunes. I'd really, really appreciate it. And with that, we'll be back in a couple weeks for another episode of iPad Pros. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.